to Torah and testimony. And where I'm getting that term, to Torah and testimony, some of you might know, but let me turn to it. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. There is a most mysterious passage. It's difficult to translate in many ways. I've taken kind of a combination of the uh, JPS and the Jewish Publication Society translation and a little bit of the RSV and a little bit of my own. So I'll read you what I have written here. Isaiah 8, 16. And we're going to go down to verse 20. Not going to read every verse, but uh, you'll get the idea. So it starts out, bind up the testimony and seal the teaching among my disciples. What an interesting phrase that is to find in the prophets. I guess someone is being addressed here, wouldn't you think? It, It is in the imperative. But bind up the testimony and seal the teaching among my disciples. So what I want to talk about is the teaching, the Torah, that's the Hebrew word, and the testimony. I'm not going to go into the Hebrew word for testimony yet. We know what it means in in English to testify or to assert something, to say something. It's translated in various ways in different translations. The next verse says, and this is God speak, this is Isaiah speaking, I will wait for Hashem, that's the divine name, Jehovah, Yahweh, YHVH. I will wait for Hashem, who's hiding his face from the house of Israel, and I will hope in him. So this is written during a time right before the Assyrian exile. It's clustered around the reign of Ahaz, as you might know from Isaiah 7. And you have reference to the hiding of the face that we associate with both exiles, really. But this is the first one, the Assyrian exile of the northern house of Israel, as they're called, the Josephite tribes, the Ephraimite tribes. So I will wait for the Lord who's hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And and then I'm skipping down to verse 19. So during that period of the hiding of the face, which we'll address in a moment, someone might say to you the following. If you're one of the disciples that has bound the testimony and the teaching. And when they say to you, consult the mediums and the wizards who chirp and mutter. You have two Hebrew words here. One refers to spirits that people contact, the spirits of the dead. Uh, Sometimes we we call the people who do that mediums. And also, the other word is formed from to know, people that claim to know. They say, I can tell you what's on the other side, on in the olam haba, the world to come. I can go there and know things and tell you. So when people say to you, uh, that's the way to be in touch with the divine, uh, what Isaiah is saying is, wait a minute, uh, should not a people consult their God? Should not a people consult Elohim, literally? Shouldn't they go to the force of all forces? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Now, in biblical thinking, idols are dead. So any kind of uh, images of God or any forces of nature that you might pray to. But this is actually addressing uh, the practice of trying to consult some sort of spirit guides, perhaps, or the dead, or some other entities, because God is not speaking. Remember, Amos also, who's writing around the same time, talks about the famine of the word. It's a very similar idea. Then you have, in verse 20, another reference to the teaching and the testimony, and it's reversed. To the teaching and the testimony, exclamation mark. So the idea there is, go to the teaching, teaching and the testimony. Now there's don't go to the mediums, don't go to the wizards, go to the teaching and the testimony. Surely for this word which they speak, there is no dawn, no light. Now that can also be translated. I think the King James had something like this um, along the lines of uh, there's no light in them that if, if you look towards these wizards and so forth. But either way, the idea is this admonition to go to the the wizards and the mediums that chirp and mutter, 
sort of making fun of them. They sort of make little noises and claim to be in touch with the other world. Uh, there's not going to be any light. Uh, the King James, I think it had, if they speak not according to my word, there's no light in them. That's a little too much for me for the Hebrew. I actually like this, uh, the JPS, surely for this word which they speak, there is no dawn. There's no, it's not going to be a morning for you uh, shedding light on your questions. So bind up the testimony and, the t and seal the teaching among your learners, literally, your disciples. And then later during the hiding of the face, go to the teaching and the testimony. So my obvious question is, what is the testimony? Uh, and we could say, what is the teaching? Uh, teaching is the word Torah, so it's some form of what we call the Torah. But what is the testimony? Some of you probably know, but stay with me here. We also have a similar notion in Deuteronomy 32, verse 20b, the last part of that verse, where in the poem of Moses, God says, I will hide my face from them and see what their end will be. So this hiding of the face, I will wait for Hashem or Jehovah, who's hiding his face from the house of Israel. And, and this idea of God hiding his face uh, is found also in this context of Deuteronomy. So Isaiah 8 and Deuteronomy 32 is where I want to start to talk about that. Exodus 25, verse 8. Let them make for me a sanctuary, it's usually translated, uh, a mikdash, that I may dwell among them. Shachan, to dwell, shekinah, the idea of the presence. And usually people just go right to the idea of the temple, right? And they talk about the temple and people want to rebuild the temple and so forth. And the Mishkan has nothing to do with the building. It has a little to do with a tent, but only because in the tent you have a meeting with the face, the panim. The hiding of the face is the idea that the panim will not manifest itself anymore. There is a hiding of the face, a, a sort of blocking of the panim. It doesn't mean God's abandoned the world, but it does mean that a level of presence, it actually can be translated the presence. The JPS often puts the presence that there's a level of presence that is not being manifested on the planet during the hiding of the face. So there can be prophets and people can have dreams and visions and revelations and all forms of uh, maybe inspiration, but there won't be this uh, panim, it's literally faces in Hebrew, it's plural, the faces, because we have two sides to our face, and it's defined very, very specifically. Let me go back to the book of Numbers. I think that's where we should start. Numbers 12, 4 through 5. I'll give you a chance to turn there. I know many of you like to turn to these and read them as I go through them. If you remember, there's a criticism of Moses by Miriam, his sister, and Aaron, his brother, because he's married a Cushite woman, an Ethiopian woman. Now, what the nature of that criticism is, uh, we're not told. People speculate all kinds of things interracial marriage, or did they just not like this particular person, or is it because she's not of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or not one of the tribes, whatever the reason was, they're very upset. And so in chapter 12, verse 4, Yahweh, or Jehovah, or Hashem, uh, I, I like the term Hashem because it gives the awesomeness of the name it's okay to say the name, Yehovah, but to know the meaning of the name, because the meaning of the name is really the nameless one that you can't name. Will is, was, Ehiye, Asher Ehiye, the name. So anyway, what it says is that God speaks, or Yahweh speaks, and he says, come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. It has the tone, even in English, of a kind of a reprimand. You three, come out here right now to this tent of meeting. Now, we're going to see the tent of meeting uh, is defined in a different way in some of the passages that we will cover. But whatever it is, it's a tent, temporary dwelling, 
ohel is the Hebrew word. And it's where you, it's, it's the ohel moed, where you meet God. So come out, you three. You know, it, it's, it sounds like an angry parent. Say, you three show up right here, right now. So they show up. And then it says, uh, Jehovah came down in a cloud pillar. That's important. We want to talk about that cloud pillar. Amud, Amad means to stand. So an Amud is a standing pillar, but it's Anan, a cloud in Hebrew, a cloud pillar. At night, it looks like ash fire. It glows. And in the daytime, it looks like a cloud. Now, in a lot of the artwork, it's pictured as, you know, 40 feet high or something like that, reaching up to the heavens. But it looks like from the idea you get from this passage and quite a few other passages is it is the presence, the face coming down and manifesting itself and stationing itself or standing in front of the door of the tent of meeting. So it seems like it's the presence maybe of someone about the size of a human being. But this person is, in, is encapsulated or enshrined in this pillar. And I guess the pillar can go up and down and so forth. We first read of that pillar in Exodus 13, 21. So you can look back and get the history of it. But this uh, Amud, this standing cloud uh, pillar, we, we call it in English. And also in Exodus 16, verse 10, that's the chapter about the manna or the bread. What is it? Remember the manna or man, it's called. There you have in verse 10, a little more about it. Uh, it says, Hine kavod Yehovah, nera ba'enan. And behold, the kavod, the kavod, the glory of Jehovah was seen in the pillar. So the idea of the pillar of the cloud is to kind of mask or shade the kavod, the glory. Kavod is also often translated presence or glory, but it's a very specific term. Uh, kavod means heavy and the idea of uh, being glorious, being really weighty, being something that's very amazing. But it appears, it's seen in the pillar. So the pillar comes down, stands in front of the tent of meeting. And what the pillar says, it's the pillar speaks basically. And it says that if there's a prophet or someone who gets a dream or whatever, that's one thing. But then it contrasts that form of revelation with the high revelation of the pillar that comes to Moses face to face. And actually, in Numbers, the passage that we're talking about now, it's mouth to mouth, pay, el pay, mouth to mouth. Like a person, like I'm speaking to you, although it's through the Internet, if I'm with you later in the future and I look at you and I speak to you mouth to mouth, it's that intimacy. So let's go to another passage where this same concept is explained more. And I'm actually going to turn to that. It's Exodus uh, 33. And this really puts these concepts together. Uh, Numbers 11, keep that in mind, and Numbers 12, where this is introduced. Exodus 33, 9. Now Moses would take the tent, the ohel, the tent. This is not the later Mishkan that is built with the curtain around it and all of the poles and so forth. This is a, a different tent. It's a different earlier tradition, I think. Now, Moses would take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, not, not in the center. So it's a tent, though, that he uses. And it's some distance from the camp. And it was called the tent of meeting. So it's called the tent of meeting, the Ohel Moed. And whoever sought Hashem or Jehovah would go out to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, sort of like an audience with the Lord, right? And eat each at the entrance of his tent and gaze after Moses till he entered the tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend. So once he's in the tent, you see this 
presence come down, this pillar of cloud, and stand, or literally it is stand, like position itself at the entrance to the tent while he spoke with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar poised at the entrance of the tent, they would rise and bow low out of respect. The presence of God has come. The kavod has come. It's the cloud is in front of the tent. Moses is inside the tent. And then you have these amazing words. So here's the key verse, verse 11. And Jehovah would speak to Moses face to face. Now this is panim el panim, face to face, presence to presence. As one man speaks to another. So mouth to mouth, face to face. And in Numbers, it says that Moses would see the uh, image, uh, timunads, in modern Hebrew, that's actually the word for photograph. You're saying an image of me. So he would see some sort of an outline or an image, whereas the cloud is at the, uh, at the entrance. And then Joshua, usually, it says Joshua, son of Nun, uh, would uh, stay there at the tent, I guess, just to make sure everybody respects and so forth doesn't come up to the entrance in deuteronomy 31 14 through 15 you have a similar scene i'm going to turn to that also deuteronomy 31 the lord said to moses uh jehovah it's the night the name jehovah said to moses the time is drawing near for you to die call joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that i may instruct him and Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. Same idea. And Jehovah appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud. The pillar of cloud having come to rest at the entrance of the tent. So you've got the picture. There's a tent. It's outside the camp, at least in the Exodus passage, Exodus 33, I think probably in Deuteronomy as well. So the key to Tabernacle Mishkan the key, the key to the idea of the Shekinah or the dwelling is the idea of the presence, the face. So wherever the presence is, wherever the cloud pillar is, and especially if it's in a tent of meeting, because that's when someone has an appointment, Moed is an appointment, a rendezvous, right? It's a rendezvous with Hashem. Whenever that happens, then you have the tent of meeting uh, operating, so to speak, with the cloud. So I think that's material that a lot of you know and you're aware of. So let's uh, connect that and see how that's connected to my subject, which is the Torah and the testimony. In Exodus 25, verse 16, uh, I'll give you time to take a look at that. Um. God says, I will put in the ark, ark is a box, really, uh, can even be used for a coffin. So people talk about the ark of the covenant, the ark of the covenant, uh, it, it's a box. If the box has something in it, then it's significant. I guess a box could be pretty, but if it's empty, what is the box for? What is the box actually holding? So let's don't focus too much on the box, Steven Spielberg and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, one, two, three, four, however many they were, brought to the attention of the world way beyond Sunday school, what, what many of us had heard all our lives about the Ark of the Covenant, and it disappeared, and it's so mysterious, and if we could only find it, and we have people, Ron Wyatt and others, who claim to have seen it and find it, found it and so forth. So it's become like a talisman, almost like a magic thing, if we could just find the Ark of the Covenant which is like saying the box of the edut, because that's the word there, edut. And what does edut mean? Testimony. So what we need to explore here is what is the testimony? Because if you know what the testimony is, it's, if in English it would be E-D-U-T, if you want to write it down. In Hebrew, it would be ayin dalet tav. So it's very easy to write, a dut, a dut, okay? So in Exodus 25, uh, you're to put the a dut into the uh, Aaron, the 
into the ark, basically, uh, as a testimony. In Exodus 16.34, there's a jar of manna that's put in the box. Uh, and the teaching is, or the instruction is, put it in the ark in front of the adut. In front of the adut. So I'm going to keep saying a dude for a while till we figure out what it is. And some of you know, but it's really interesting to just read through these. I printed out all 40 passages where the a dude is mentioned. This is in the JPS, 40 references to the a dude. And it's consistently the same. The meaning is always the same in these contexts, in these 40. And it's something concrete that is associated with the box. In fact, it's the reason for the box. It holds the adut. And then you can put other things in, like the rod of Aaron is put in the box with the adut. The jar of manna is put in the box with the adut. Uh, Exodus 25, verse 16, deposit it in the ark of the adut. There I want you to notice the phrase, the ark should be called the Ark of the Adut. I've never heard anybody say that. Uh, try it with somebody. Everybody's heard of the Ark of the Covenant. And that is used, but in the Torah, in these portions of the Torah that we're reading, particularly Ter Terumah and Tetzavah and Ki Tesah as we go ahead, it's always the Adut, the, the box of the Adut. So what is the Adut? Well, if you call the Ark the Ark of the Adut, it's pretty clear that the box is meant to hold the Adut. It's for the Adut. That's why you built the box. Now, everybody thinks of the box that uh, is built in the upcoming Torah portions that is gold-plated, and it's made out of Ikea wood, and it has these carabim on top and so forth. That is a form of of the box that is recorded in the book of Atrocitus, but I'm going to suggest to you, and I've written about this, some of you read my writing about it, that there's a tradition of a earlier box, and it's that box that you probably want to focus on, even though that box is probably in the bigger box to protect it and to allow it to be transported because it has poles on it and so forth. In Exodus 30, verse 6, there's mention of the cover, sometimes called the mercy seat, really bad translation. It just means the covering that's over the adut, where I will meet with you. Now notice that connects to the meeting. So something about the box, the adut that's inside the box, and it's covered. It has a gold-plated covering over it, and it's above, uh, between the two carabim, in Exodus 30, verse 6, where we read, where I will meet with you. So this is a modification of that tent where Moses would be outside the camp, and he would go inside and see the uh, form of the Lord, a kind of image of the Lord, of God, of Hashem, of Jehovah, and uh, meet with them. But here it's being more regulated as they're building this larger Mishkan. But notice, remember, the whole point of the Mishkan is that I may dwell among you. Shakan, to dwell. Exodus 30, 36. You're taking some of this, uh, I guess you'd say the, the powder or incense that's made out of these different herbs, remember? The various herbs that make up the incense into a compound. And so now we're going to have something else put in. Beat some of it into powder and put some of it before the adut in the tent of meeting. Before the adut in the tent of meeting. Exodus 31, 7. This is when the larger box is made. Uh, you're going to make the tent of meeting and the ark for the adut. Isn't that interesting? It literally says, uh, most of the references say the box of the adut which is almost the same thing. You know, it's the box or the adut. But this actually has the preposition la. It's the box for the adut. 
You know, somebody says, make a box. What for? What, what's the box for? It's for the a dude. So you see how important this a dude is. Um, Leviticus 24.3, not going to do all 40, by the way, but I picked about, what, a dozen. You're to, uh, it refers to the veil that divides the tent of meeting into two compartments. Remember, in the first compartment, you have fresh baked bread, incense, and a candelabra burning oil. Can you imagine going into this pitch dark tent and you have this glow of these oil lamps and the smell of the bread and the beautiful smell of the incense? That's supposed to get you ready for the presence. And then you go behind the veil, which is now kind of like the little tent that Moses made. And you go behind the veil and it says that the Incense is going to be outside the veil of the Edut. So do you see how you're calling the veil? Say, what is that veil separating the two rooms? That's the veil of the Edut. It's so specific. And yet, you never hear anybody talk about the Edut. What is it? Finally, uh, Numbers 915 of our 40. This is the last one for what I want to do now. Talks about the Mishkan getting set up the tabernacle, and it says a cloud covered the tabernacle. Well, you would expect that. This is going to come up in a couple of uh, readings in the future. It covered the tabernacle, the tent of the Edut. So the entire tabernacle, the tent of meeting, is called the tent of the Edut. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so the idea is that you meet there's this tent of Moed. But what is the tent of the Moed? It's the tent of the Edut. So we really need to know and think about the Edut. So what is it? We have a couple of places. The best place to go is Exodus 31, right where I am right now. Verse 18. Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And God is finishing giving him the revelation. He's just told him about the Sabbath day and how it's a sign forever of the creation, going all the way back to creation, Genesis 2, verses 2, 3, and 4. And when he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the Edut, stone tablets inscribed with the finger of God. So if you didn't know before, now you know. What is the Edut? I've got an iPad here. I don't think it's going to qualify. It's not in a box, but it's got a case on it. I could take the case off. And uh, we call it a tablet. Many of you have tablets. This happens to be an Apple tablet. So a tablet, a literally surface to write on made of stone, if you turn to the next chapter, 3215, you get uh, more of a description of it. I'll read it to you. Moses turned and went down the mountain, bearing the two tablets of the Edut. So there are two tablets. I just have one here, two, two iPads, so to speak, two tablets, inscribed on both their surfaces. They were inscribed on the one side and the other. So you could turn them around and look at one side or the other. Some people have suggested this could be something like we would associate with a holograph or something like that. And we've just read that the tablets contain the Edut. And the Edut is, in fact, the writing of God, of what we call the Ten Words or the Decalogue. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing, incised on the tablets. Now, of course, those tablets are broken, as you know, and uh, another set is later made. We won't go into that right now. So let me talk a little bit about the box from the tradition, not of the Ark in Exodus with the gold plates and the carabim and the cover and so forth. Let's call it the first Ark the ark that Moses made. It's a different tradition. It's in Deuteronomy 10, where God tells Moses, come up to the mountain 
And you know those tablets that you broke? I will inscribe on the tablets the commandments were, that were on the first tablets. There's going to get a second set. The first ones are broken. They're ruined. They're shattered like glass. They were probably, maybe they were some kind of a flint type rock or something like that. Translucent maybe. Uh, who knows? So he's told to make an ark of wood. And he makes an ark of Achaia wood. This is in chapter three. And he carves out two tablets of stone like the first. So presumably out of the side of the mountain or whatever, you can get these stone tablets that one could write on. And I took the tablets with me and went up the mountain. And Jehovah inscribed on the tablets the same text as on the first. The Ten Commandments, I'm reading the JPS, that he addressed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. And Jehovah gave them to me. And when I left, I went down from the mountain and I deposited the tablets in the box that I had made. So the way I understand this, and there are different interpretations, and the rabbis have long discussions about this in some of their rabbinic literature, it sounds to me like this is a, a box that Moses can carry. So it's not this box with poles and gold plated, and that's that's later the resting place of the Edut. And I would think this box goes inside the gold plated box. That makes the most sense to me in terms of uh, these traditions that are reflecting different kinds of uh, things being passed down. And so this would be uh, a smaller box of maybe, I would think of it like a, a jewelry box of some type, you know, that's a case. And the adud is put inside there. It's, it's the most precious relic that Israel has because it's come from Sinai. But it's not precious because of its uh, artifact value oh, this is an ancient writing or something like that. It's precious because of what's on it. What's on it is written what's called the testimony, the adut. So what is the adut? It's the 10 words, basically. And written on the stone, it becomes an object that's put in the box, which is put in the bigger box, which is then put in the tent, which is in front of the veil, and the tent as a whole is even called the tent for the Edut. So everything is focusing down, not on the first room, the second room in the later tent of meeting. And the ark is for the Edut, the tent is for the Edut, and it all has to do with the presence of God gathering and meeting this cloud presence, this uh, Onan the Amud Onan being represented in that space, that sacred space. So Moses then writes his teaching or Torah in that book that Moses writes in Exodus 31. I'm not going to go over it again, but it, it's it's put, it, it says in, in the side of the ark. Uh, sounds like it's not in the box, but maybe there's a place for it to slide or fit. Anyway, it is associated still with the box, but the box is for the Edu, not for the Torah. But you see how they're associated. So when you say to Torah and testimony, you go to the Torah that Moses wrote and the adut or the testimony of the ten tablet of, of the ten matters or words that are on the tablets. Now, before I go to what I want to do next, I want to go to the book of Revelation in the New Testament, because I think this is a Jewish book originally. If you look on my blog, jamestabor.com. I have an article, pretty extensive article, based on a graduate class that I taught. And I think it's called something like somebody could post it if, if you wanted to look it up and put the uh, URL. Can we recover a pre-Christian copy of the book of Revelation? And, and I argue that you can. And in that pre-Christian copy, which is ref reflecting Second Temple Judaism, I think... Uh, coming from the circles of John the Baptist, uh, you can read what I argue based on Josephine Massenberg Ford and her commentary in the book of Revelation in the Anchor Bible series. Anyway, chapter 15, this is very much at the end when the judgment of God is actually revealed. Now notice, whoever wrote this, this is in Greek, but whoever wrote this knows about the thing that I'm teaching right here. 
Because in verse 5 it says, I looked and behold, the temple of the tent of the testimony in heaven was opened. Isn't that interesting? So there's this idea that the box on earth that holds the adut is a reflection, remember the blueprint idea, of the temple in heaven. And this is an idea we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You find it in other Jewish literature that the earthly presence of God is just a reflection of the heavenly presence of God. So in the heavenly presence of God, if you go in the, quote, heavenly temple, in Second Temple Jewish tradition, notice it's called still the tent of the testimony, as if there's a tent in heaven. Is Friedman right that the real point of the building, follow me here, there's a building which protects the tent, which protects the box, which protects the little box, which protects the adut, which symbolizes the presence of God. Isn't that interesting? So it's sort of like you're coming down, down, down into what it's really for. So you actually have the tent here in the New Testament referred as the tent of the testimony. So what is the testimony? Well, then uh, it says the tent, the temple was filled with smoke and there's earthquakes and all of these plagues come upon the world. And the idea would be because people are not following the testimony. So it's worldwide. It's not a Jewish law. But it's a law intended for, and, and I don't even know that we should call it a law. It's a testimony intended for all of humankind. It's the creator God, Elohim, the Elohim of, of all Elohim, right? The force of all forces. Will is, was, the one who will be and is and was, declaring to the world a testimony, sometimes called a covenant. But it would only be a covenant if you hear the testimony and pledge yourself to follow it. Then it becomes a covenant. So let me read you something. Uh, I think the, one of the other times I talked recently, I mentioned Hertz. So this is Dr. J.H. Hertz, chief rabbi of the British Empire at the time he published this. And this is the second edition. I bought it in 1970. It had just come out in 69, the new edition. I'm sorry, 1971, I was living in Los Angeles, going to Pepperdine University, getting my master's degree. So I'm making that point because I'm very fond of the book itself. And if you buy one book besides a good translation of the Tanakh, and I would recommend the JPS, but if you buy one book, it should be Hertz. If you want to study the Torah and the prophets, particularly the Haftarahs. So I marked here, and some of you have this book, so I want to get the page number, page 294, okay? And I want to read you this. It's uh, Exodus 20, 19 and 20, with the, what are usually called the Ten Commandments, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The ten words, he says, or commandments, often called the Decalogue, from Deca, ten, and Logos, words. So when we say the Ten Commandments, it's literally the Ten Words, and I'll get back to that. Here's what he says. This is worth reading. I want to get this recorded, and I want to read it. It's sublimely written. So the Decalogue, the Ten Words, are supreme among the precepts of the Torah, both on account of their fundamental and far-reaching importance, and on account of the awe-inspiring manner in which they were revealed to the whole nation. This is the Sinai event to receive the ten words in the cloud and fire pillar. Amid thunder and lightning and the sounding of the shofar, amid flames of fire that envelop the smoking mountain. And you read in the Song of Moses, you read in the book of Habakkuk, the Eshdot, the fire law. Remember David Horitz would always talk about that. That in the, is in the wilderness of Paran on Mount Horeb. The majestic voice pronounced the words which from that day to this have been the guide of conduct to humankind. That revelation was the most remarkable event in the history of humanity. Notice he says humanity, humankind. It was the birth hour of the religion of the spirit. 
which was destined in time to illuminate the souls and order the lives of all the children of men, the entire world. The Decalogue is a sublime summary of human duties binding upon all humankind. It's not Jewish. It's given to the world. According to the rabbis, it was given in 70 languages to the nations as well. A summary unequal for simplicity, comprehensiveness, and solemnity. A summary which bears divinity on its face and cannot be antiquated as long as the world endures. Don't you love this 19th century training that Hertz had and how he can write into the 20th century this wonderful English language? Is at the same time a divine epitome of the fundamentals of Israel's creed of life and life. And Jewish teachers, ancient and modern, have looked upon it as the fountainhead which could not be derived, uh, fountainhead from which all Jewish truth and Jewish teaching could be derived, sorry. These commandments are written on the walls of synagogue and church, and they are the world's laws for all time. Never will their empire cease. The prophetic cry is true. The word of our God endures forever. So. I love that quote from Hertz. Now, let me ask you this, and then I'm going to tell you where the box and the adut are. So I know you're going to want to wait for that. I've got nine minutes left if I end on time in an hour. And I certainly can go a little longer if we need to. But uh, 10 words. You remember when you're in grade school, you learn that little poem? I don't know. Old people learned it like I learned it. Uh, for grammar, since you're trying to learn what is a noun, what is a pronoun, what is an adjective, what is a verb, and so forth. And it went something like, all names of persons, places, things are nouns like Caesar, Rome, and kings. And then it went on, pronouns are used in place of nouns and so forth. I bet many of you can quote that. It's kind of interesting to think back when you were probably in third or fourth grade. But I, I like that because... When you say names of things, names of things, words, you name a thing, you're not really naming the thing, you're representing it with a word, you see. So if I say, you know, desk, table, uh, I'm using a word, desk, but Plato taught us this. The word desk is not the thing, the table is the thing, and I'm referring to the desk. So that's basic, that's elementary, that's obvious, that's what it, our theory of language is. But, so when you say the 10 words, you really need to say the 10 things, or even better, because davar is a thing, right? The 10 things. Even better in English, the, the 10 matters. Davar can mean a matter. Like if I say, I need to speak to you about this matter. Usually that's done like when there's a problem, right? We need to talk about this matter. Or as to the matter of this, as to the subject. So it can be 10 subjects, 10 headings, 10 things. But matters in English works pretty well for Devar. So Decalogue is the 10 words, literally. But what does Logos mean? Logos, the 10 logia means the 10 matters, it's the same thing. So I love the word Decalogue, but I like the specificity of the Decalogue faith because when you say the Decalogue faith, not only are you talking about the 10 matters as they're expounded throughout scripture with all of their implications and meaning, but you're also talking about the cloud presence that gave the 10 matters and how they were preserved and put in the box, which is put in the box, which is put in the tent, which is put in the uh, temple, which is reflective then of that moment in history when God revealed himself to humankind. And so not, not only is it that presence of God, but, it, but what God is really saying to humanity, the 10 words, the 10 matters, I think it's incredible. So what is the Decalogue faith? Now, people know about the Ten Commandments, so uh, people put them in courthouses in various places and arguments by atheists and believers and unbelievers about whether the Ten Commandments are part of one religion or another religion. 
But remember the seventh day, remembering the seventh day Sabbath is, is one of the 10 matters, which most of Christianity has decided is not important and as an alternative celebrates the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday. And that would be up to individuals if they want to celebrate that. But it's not one of the Ten Matters. You don't read in the Ten Commandments uh, where that occurs. And it has a different meaning. Uh, the Sabbath day is a memorial of creation of Genesis 1. And we just saw that in Exodus 31. So I love this idea. We're proclaiming the Decalogue faith with all of its implications. So that would be, how did we get that? What is the revelation at Sinai? What does it all mean? And I think it's very helpful to talk about, we don't have to confuse people with Hebrew, the edut all the time, because people wonder, what are you talking about, edut? How do you spell that? The testimony we use, the creator of heaven and earth, at a moment in time, on the day of the assembly, gave a testimony and a dute that was written down and preserved, and everything is then built around it. But that central point comes through in all of the sources. Some use Ark of the Covenant, some of the sources, but Ark of the Testimony is used 40 times. It's the most frequent, certainly in the Torah. So I'm going to wind up here in a second, but I want to ask you where, what happened to it? Because everybody always wants to know, you know, you can do the spiritual, religious, devotional, inspirational talk all day. But if you're going to talk at the end about where it is, uh, everybody perks up. Like Faber, Faber does archaeology. He's been to Israel 72 times and I wonder if he knows something about uh, what happened to the ark. Well, I think the best source is in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. And it's not the source 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees is quoting a source that is called uh, apographes, which means in Greek a writing or a document. So the author of 2 Maccabees claims to have a document. And he says in this document, so this is a second temple Jewish source. 2 Maccabees is written in the first century B.C. This is the oldest tradition. There are lots of traditions. Ethiopia, you've got later traditions. You've got traditions about, among the rabbis, that the box of the Edut, I'm going to call it the box of the Edut instead of Ark of the Covenant. The box of the Edut is under the temple. That's a really common view among um, many Jews that I know in Israel. So let me read you what this oldest source says. This is the oldest source we have as far as I know. Somebody knows one older, please tell me. I don't think there is one. It is written in the writings that the prophet Jeremiah, having received an oracle, ordered that the tent and the box should follow with him. So he's going to go somewhere and somebody is going with him, taking the tent and the box. Now, whether he would take a gold-plated box with carabim and poles or whether he's simply taking the little box that Deuteronomy 10 refers to, in, according to this tradition, I'm not sure, but I would say the latter. And I would say the tent. He certainly wouldn't be taking all of the poles and the stands and the brass fittings and so forth. I think the tent is probably the tent that you can fold up, and it was the tent that is the smaller tent that is the tent of the Adut. You know, you don't need this huge tent in order to have the adut. The adut is the inner tent, so to speak, that maybe was in the temple. So he takes them out to a mount, to the mountain where Moses had gone up and had seen the inheritance of God. Now, that mountain is identifiable. It's called Pisgah, Pisgah, and there's Nebo, and there's a valley in between where Moses was buried, remember, Beit Peel. So between Pisgah which is to the north, and Nebo to the south, there's this valley. And that's where, according to this text, uh, Jeremiah goes. And Jeremiah came and found a cave. Isn't that interesting? This is before Dead Sea Scrolls were being found uh, 
and talked about even in the ancient world. You know, we do have reports of some scrolls being found in caves and writings being found in caves uh, as early as, uh, let's see, Origen, which would be the third century AD. And of course, later, uh, Timotheus, uh, the bishop, Christian bishop, and finally in 1947, some of the scrolls we know as Qumran. But here's a cave. And he brought there the tent and the ark and the altar of incense. This sounds like three things that you could carry. The tent wrapped up, folded up in the box with the adut. I assume it's got the adut or why would you take an empty box? And the altar of incense. And he sealed up the entrance. And some of those who followed him came up to mark the way, but could not find it. And when Jeremiah learned of it, he rebuked them and declared, and by the way, this is after the Babylonian captivity in 586. And, you know, Jeremiah's story is told all through the siege of Nebuchadnezzar and so forth. And you can read that in the book of Jeremiah. When Jeremiah learned of it, he rebuked them and said, the place shall, the place shall remain unknown until God gathers his people together again and shows his mercy. Then the Lord will disclose these things and the glory of the Lord and the cloud will appear as they were shown in the days of Moses. So you see that idea of how the cloud, the glory, the box, the tent, and the kavod are all associated in this text. So I don't know what value that text has, but I do know that whoever wrote that text has got the cluster right. You need the adut in the box, in the tent, and it's associated with the cloud pillar, as we've seen today.